All right, welcome everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started right here at 10 o'clock. Uh, we'll have a number of people probably joining us here in the next few minutes and and others, of course, will um, we'll have this recording sent uh, to them as well as to each of you. Uh, so we hope that you'll be able to pass this on. It'll be as a YouTube link so you can forward it to uh, those that uh, you think might be really interested uh, in what we're going to talk about today, uh, which is the neighboring movement, the good neighbor uh, experiment, uh, which we're really excited to talk about uh, once again. In 2019, uh, a cohort of participants uh, went through the process with the help of Ryan Klink, who uh, was a United Methodist who was among us and is now uh, serving elsewhere now. Uh, and so some of you may you know, be experienced with this. And what I noticed then and, and notice now is that a lot of conversations are happening about neighboring, about how we are good neighbors, how we develop relationships and friendships with those right around us, taking seriously God's, uh, Jesus' words of loving our neighbors. Um, and there's plenty of books out there. Uh, there's plenty of tools, uh, but it's really um, all about relationships uh, and uh, the kind of accountability um, that something like a good neighbor experiment and something like having a coach like uh, like Jessica uh, Wright, who's going to be uh, coordinating and leading uh, this cohort here, having that accountability and, and guidance really makes the difference in making it success, successful because mm -hmm. uh, we do this in community. Uh, so before we begin, I'd love to, uh, Andy, uh, Lewis, uh, if you would lead us in prayer. You bet, I'd be happy to. Welcome everybody, let's pray. Oh, good and gracious God, we are reminded in John's gospel that the word became flesh and lived among us, moved into the neighborhood, as it were, and that you walked among us, that you befriended us, that you saw us and built relationship with us. God, help us to model our ministry after that incarnational love. God, help us to do more than merely extend an invitation to church, but God, extend uh, the love of the church through relationships to our actual neighbors. And God, may this conversation today uh, inspire us and equip us and be a springboard to that kind of uh, incarnational ministry, uh, the opportunity for which is all around us and right before us, especially in this season. We thank you for those who've come to guide us and to lead us. May you bless them and give us all open minds and hearts to what you have to share to us today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you all very much for being here. I am honored by your presence. Um, so my name, as Andrew mentioned, is Jessica Wright, and I am an associate pastor in the North Texas Conference. I serve at First Allen. I'm an elder under appointment and um, recently became a trained facilitator for the Good Neighbor Experiment with the Neighboring Movement. And I'm delighted today because a couple of the folks from the Neighboring Movement are here to introduce themselves and to lead us through sharing a bit of what they do. So I'll turn it over to Adam and Maddie. Hello, I'm Adam Barlow Thompson. I'm one of the co-founders here at the Neighboring Movement in Wichita, Kansas. And I'm excited to uh, share what we've been up to and see if there's ways that we might partner with all of you. And hey, y'all, my name is Maddie and I'm the faith-based organizer here at the Neighboring Movement. My project is the Good Neighbor Experiment and I'm also a deacon in the Great Plains Annual Conference. And so as Adam shared, we're just excited to be here and uh, see what's next. Thank y'all. Um, well, and I think whenever a group gets together, there's some power in um, sharing who we are and where we're coming from. I know we don't get to do this very often in these sorts of formats, um, but we're, I think we're a small enough group that if you wanted to, please um, unmute yourself, take turns, you know, we're all grownups, and share your name and what church um, you attend or serve. 
And um, then in the chat, because I'm confident that grownups can do more than one thing at a time. I'm a mom and a pastor. I, I know we can do this. Um, if you wanted to share in the chat an observation, a story, a couple of sentences about a time you've had an opportunity to be a good neighbor or when someone has been a good neighbor to you, I would love to see some of those stories. Um, so I feel like she's my friend and I can call on her. So Carrie, would you introduce yourself first? Yes, uh, my name is Carrie Smith, and I am the pastor at Greenland Hills UMC, which is really close to SMU. So um, that's all I'm supposed to share. And I'll call on CJ Rice. Hello, I'm CJ Rice. I'm the youth minister at FUMC McKinney. Am I supposed to go? I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow Carrie's suit. So Kenneth, how about Kenneth go? Yes, I'm Kenneth Wolverton. I am a laity at Grace Avenue United Methodist Church, and I also serve as the uh, lay leader for the North Central District. And I will call on Ted. Good morning. My name is Ted Hyde. I'm lay leader for a small little Methodist church in Flower Mound called Treach Memorial United Methodist Church. And so, Kim Bryant, would you introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Kim Bryant, and I am the Administrative Assistant at Pleasant Valley United Methodist Church in Saxe. Let's see, and who can I get? <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, let's see, Kenneth Wolverton, have you spoken? No, he's muted. Let me see. I'm having trouble here. Okay. I, um, I can do it again, but it's the same thing. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Vicki Busby, have you spoken yet? <laughs> Not yet. Good morning. I worship at Grace United Methodist Church in Sherman, and I'm laity there. Um, how about Deanna? Good morning, I'm Deanna Lowe. I am the pastor at Westview United Methodist Church and Floyd United Methodist Church, both in Greenville. Oh, um, <laughs> let's see, uh, Paige. Good morning, I am Paige Christian from Christ United Methodist Church, serving as the associate pastor of off-campus ministries and working closely with Jessica as we have piloted this initiative in our church. Um, I will call on Cindy. Uh, yeah, my name is Cindy Kennedy. I'm the pastor at Pilot Point United Methodist Church. Been here a couple of years, mostly during the pandemic. So uh, this is a good opportunity for us to <laughs> figure out what's next. So I appreciate being here. And I will call on Patricia. Hi, this is Patricia Harden. I am a member at First United Methodist Church at Pilot Point, um, and I got invited to this meeting through Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. I'll go. Uh, I'm Ashley Ann. I'm the lead pastor at Vista Ridge United Methodist Church in Coppell, Louisville, on the border, and I will call on Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon O'Connor, and I'm an elder at Custer Road United Methodist Church, and um, my role is congregational care. I call on Rick Hawkins. Yes, hi. My name is Rick Hawkins, pastor at Cornerstone UMC in North Gullet. Happy to be here. And I will call on, <laughs> let's see, Pete Corbin. Hi, good morning. My name is Pete Corwin. I'm a member of Button United Methodist Church. And I'm hoping someone volunteers. So I'll go. I'm Rodney Whitfield. I'm the pastor at Aldersgate United Methodist Church in North Carrollton. I think that leaves Ginger. Good morning. I'm Ginger Nichols. I'm the certified lay servant at Pleasant Valley United Methodist Church in Saxe. Awesome. Well, welcome all of you. Thank you for taking this time to be here with us. Um, and then some things have started popping over in the chat. And so um, 
feel free to continue sharing your stories of being or having a good neighbor because I think um, celebrating those moments reinforces why this is something that is so important in our lives. But I wanted to share just a little bit that um, during the pandemic lockdown, I realized how much I had not cultivated as many meaningful relationships in my neighborhood as I wanted. I um, I wondered if there was a neighbor nearby that I felt comfortable enough with that I could say like, um, can I have some toilet paper? Y'all remember when we couldn't find that? That is a special kind of vulnerability. And I realized I didn't have a lot of those people near me. So I was a kid who grew up watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and Sesame Street. And I had this deep longing for that idea of neighbors, but I felt like I didn't have much luck in actually forming those close bonds. In my neighborhood where I was living at the time, folks pulled into their alleys, straight into the garage and closed the door before they'd even gotten out of the car. If folks were out in the neighborhood, a lot of times they had AirPods in their ears and they were moving with a purpose, looking like I needed to mind my own business. They were not looking for a relationship in that moment. I felt awkward trying to figure out how to get to know my neighbors and not be that weird lady on the street. So I heard about the neighboring movement and signed up for their weekly emails Sometimes their hints were so obvious that I couldn't believe I hadn't thought of them myself. Like, I don't know, spend some time outside your house, in the front, where the people are. And then I heard about the Good Neighbor Experiment. And I realized I wasn't alone in trying to figure out how to become a better neighbor, not just for my own sake, but to help heal deep divisions in our communities. So I reached out to the neighboring movement to see how my church could participate. As I had more and more conversations with Maddie, I think she could feel my passion for this work and invited me to be a part of the next facilitator cohort. So this past fall, our cohort experienced the Good Neighbor Experiment at an accelerated pace so that we could all serve as trail guides and cheerleaders and storytellers in our own communities. I'm so honored to be a part of this work because I feel it's a practical and empowering way to live out our call to love God and to love neighbor. So to say a little bit more about the neighboring movement and the Good Neighbor Experiment, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Well, thank you, Jessica. That was uh, such a great introduction. So I um, wanted to give you a little bit of context. So the neighboring movement is was started um, in 2015. And we, I'm a, I'm an elder in the UMC, was serving in a local church. My wife is a deacon in the UMC. She was serving in a different local church. And um, we were, we started to re recognize that a lot of our church work <clears throat> was, um, was feeling really, there was a lot of scarcity around the work that we were doing. And uh, in particular, the thing that comes to my mind when I, when I mean scarcity is the annual turkey supper. Whew, that annual turkey supper was killing me because we'd been doing it for a long time and it was started for a really good reason and served and brought people into the church in an important way. But 20 years later, nobody wanted to do it anymore. We all felt guilty that we didn't want to do it anymore. And even though we were really grumpy about it, we were forcing ourselves to do it anyways. And then we'd have the annual turkey supper and the only people who'd come were the same old people who always come. And then we'd all be frustrated because we put all this effort into this thing that didn't really feel like it was abundant and only made us feel like we just worked really hard to do the same old thing. So we got together with a group of people who were all feeling that scarcity. And we said, what, what is a more authentic way to just live out our faith? And what we realized felt most authentic to us was simply being good neighbors where we lived. So myself and my wife and our across the street neighbors, Matt and Katherine Johnson, started meeting weekly to figure out what it would look like just to be really good neighbors. And over time, we'd have people reach out to us because of our Methodist connections and say, hey, we see you doing all this stuff in the neighborhood. Could you come and teach our church how to do that as well? So we put together some like ideas, some you know, easy steps that you could take. And slowly that grew into a full not blown nonprofit. And now the neighboring movement has the faith-based component, which you are now experiencing that's called the Good Neighbor Experiment. And um, we were lucky enough to receive a grant from the Lilly Endowment in 2020, where we could bring on facilitators like Jessica, who uh, are all over the country recruiting churches to participate in these cohorts where they learn about how to shift from a, a scarcity to abundance 
and, and to be good neighbors wherever you're located. We also do some other work and just wanted to highlight that briefly that we work still in our neighborhood here in Wichita and we also have um, learning cohorts that are not faith-based where people are trained and all of our work is trained is is about asset-based community development and working with people who uh, to to see the gifts and the strengths in their community as a starting point for the way that we interact with one another and so that all of that work has been happening um, over uh, the last uh, in 2017 we had our first official cohort of the good neighbor experiment and since then, I was trying to tally it up this morning. I think we're close to like 150 churches that have been a part of our faith-based cohorts um, since 2017. We also are excited that we've just struck up a partnership with the United Methodist uh, Discipleship Ministries. And um, we have a tool called the Recycle. It's actually the, this is the model of it right here on my wall. And it's a tool of practicing uh, discernment in community. And that is gonna be um, a little resource that's gonna be released through Discipleship Ministries this annual conference season. And so all of these things are coming out, but they all have a similar theme. And that is we're looking for ways to shift from that scarcity to abundance, to focus on relationship and to have a lot of fun doing it. And I think right now that's the part of this work that means the most to me because it's so easy to get bogged down in general. And I think especially in ministry because it's hard right now. There's just a lot of stuff that make it hard right now. And so how do we have joy? How do we have hope? And these cohorts, that's one of the, the things that I really love about them is that it gives us that opportunity to do it. So um, I think that's my bit. I'm going to turn it to Maddie, who's going to give you more specifics about the actual Good Neighbor experiment and how you can participate. Yeah. So I am a very logistic visual brain. And so I have some slides for y'all to kind of talk about what you can expect outcomes wise, as well as what the nine months training looks like. So this first slide you'll see um, describes some of the outcomes that we um, hope for, not only throughout the Good Neighbor Experiment, but when the nine months is over. You heard Adam start to talk about the first um, kind of the left side column, which describes the culture shift. And so all throughout the nine months, we see every um, you know small group, every reflection, every experiment that you do over these nine months as a way to shift in culture as individuals and as a church um, from being focused on programming to instead focusing on relationship, as Adam described, to shift from scarcity to abundance and then to shift from inauthenticity to joy. That's what our work is grounded in. And throughout the nine months, we, we see in big and small ways, this culture shift start to take place in individuals as well as in the church itself. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the right side, you'll see kind of the really like, what practically do you get out of the good neighbor experiment? And we kind of classified as like neighboring tools. Like what are the tools and resources uh, that come throughout the nine months that help equip you to be a better neighbor to your actual literal neighbors? Some of those tools are a eight front doors block map, being able to actually map out your neighborhood as well as your church neighborhood and, and kind of see where the relationships are and see how we might shift them over time in authentic ways. Um, as Adam mentioned, all of our work is grounded in asset-based community development. And so we, we offer an entire section devoted to this um, through what we call the gifts garden. And that's growing our gifts garden, seeing how God is already moving and present in our neighborhoods and, and uh, particularly around our church building. Um, and so some others uh, have called this an asset map and some of you might be familiar with, with that term. Um, we equip folks in learning conversations, which is a simple yet powerful tool to build relationship and grow closer um, to neighbors and even within the local church. And then the last tool that you'll see on there is what Adam was describing, the recycle, which is our community discernment model. And so those are just some of the tools that you'll get over the nine months, but there's a, an emphasis on the culture shift as well as practical things you will get uh, by the end. So what is actually gonna happen in the nine months? Uh, I have a few slides to kind of describe what the process is. And 
kind of the very immediate what to do next would be register and start gathering your neighboring team. We recommend gathering a group of about four to 10 folks in your local church. It kind of depends on church size, um, but four to 10 folks who are eager to be better neighbors. Um, and, and sometimes that looks like obvious leaders in your church community. Sometimes it doesn't look like obvious folks, but who might be a good fit to grow in, in kind of these culture shifts that, that you see in the slide before. Um, once you've gathered your, your team, your team will come to the first workshop, which will be in-person, co-facilitate co-facilitated by us at the Neighboring Movement and by Jessica, who is your uh, GNE facilitator. And we'll have an in-person workshop, which really serves as a train the trainer, um, so that those leaders that you've brought to that workshop will really be equipped to not only know the material themselves, but to be the catalyst in your local church and see how you might grow neighboring in your church family. Um, that first workshop focuses on neighboring where you live. So this is a little bit more individual focus, looking at your own neighborhood and, and your own block that you live to try and grow in relationship. Um, those, that first workshop equips your team to dive deeper into what we call labs. So with the theme of Good Neighbor Experiment, we have four labs in total, and each lab is basically a six week small group study. And so that first workshop will equip your team to dive deeper into lab one and lab two. Lab one is kind of the basic, like what are the ingredients of neighboring, which we see as relationship, abundance, and joy. And then lab two focuses on looking at your neighborhood and um, building relationship with the eight front doors that are nearest to you. Um, so that, that is kind of the first half of the Good Neighbor Experiment. And you'll go back to your local church after workshop one, dive deeper into these labs or small group uh, studies. And then you also have Jessica as, as kind of a coach throughout this process, somebody you can call to check in and just kind of say what's going well, what, what could be improved? How could this really take shape contextually in your local church? And then you'll come back for workshop two, which kind of lands in the halfway point of, of uh, the nine months. And this is where you shift from, instead of focusing on neighboring where you live, you focus on neighboring as a church, really starting to see the church not as a service provider, not as um, you know a, a place to evangelize and get butts in the pews, um, but to instead see your church as a community connector. And so this is where the asset-based language really takes shape. And you'll come with your neighboring team to that second workshop in person and go back then um, ready and equipped to dive into labs three and four, um, which is about growing your gifts garden, seeing the assets in your neighborhood and in your the neighborhood surrounding your church, and then diving into that discernment model to see what God might um, be calling you and your church to next. Then we conclude after that nine months with a final workshop, again, in person, you'll bring your neighboring team and we have a time of celebration. We have an opportunity to discern next steps. And we also will um, have all of our resources that are available to alumni, uh, g and &E alumni churches. We also have a GNE alumni community with regular coaching calls um, and supplemental resources that, that will be available to you and your church even beyond the nine months because um, we want to stay connected and continue being good neighbors in community. And you can see as well some of those other resources that you have. Um, so I know that was a lot. I have kind of a summary slide of what we just talked about. So this is either going to be more or less stressful for you. For me as a visual person, it is less stressful to see it all mapped out. But this is kind of what the nine months looks like. Um, and this particular cohort that uh, Jessica is leading will kick off with that first workshop on April 30th. And um, the pricing for each church really depends on how many churches are gathered for that cohort. And you can see that breakdown um, below. And so that will, um, that $500 deposit will be due by workshop one. And then we'll let you know based on how many churches, what that remaining cost would be by workshop two. So I'm gonna stop talking. I've talked a lot and we would love to just um, give some opportunity for any questions or points of clarification about what this nine months of the Good Neighbor Experiment looks like. Hey, 
I have two questions, I think. Um, the first of which is, would you recommend, as somebody who's just been appointed to a new church, uh, diving into this? That's my first question. The second question is, I've just been appointed to a commuter church. Mm -hmm. So as we are working through some of the uh, first lab as getting to know your neighbors, and then we move to the second lab of getting to know the community around the church, those are going to be very different places for a lot of my people. So do you see this as something that works in that sort of model? Yeah, it's a great question. So we've got, um, I mean, I think the answer is always yes. We always are like, yeah, we'll figure it out. So we do, I do think it's a really helpful tool for a new appointment because it's it's a lot like, you know, in new appointments, you're trying to, you're trying to learn the field and that this gives you a, a built-in process for doing that. The other thing that we've, we've added and it's kind of a supplemental resource is how do you do intra-church neighboring. So how do you do the same activities within the congregation? Because we have a ton of churches who actually don't know each other very well, especially in this moment. It's like, I don't even know who's going to show up every Sunday, let alone like who my regular people are, right? It's, just, it's really hard to be sure of th that my people know each other in meaningful ways. And so a lot of the practices, basically, you can um, go through them the first time just doing it with each other to get to know each other more. And then some churches will even do that full process just within their congregation before they actually go and do it within the neighborhood of the congregation. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's one way. I don't, Maddie may have more specific experiences with that too, so. I mean, I think you did a, a good job describing. I There is a piece with the Good Neighbor Experiment where there is flexibility I mean, we have we have a structure and like a recommended kind of sequence of it's really good to like flex this neighboring muscle before you really dive in your church and do it. But I, I really think that's what the coaching calls really serve is being able to check in with Jessica of like, hey, like this isn't working as well in our local church context. What ideas might you have? And, and so I think that's where the coaching really comes into is like, how, how does this take shape contextually in your local church? Um, and we have worked with a wide range of, of churches, rural churches, urban, suburban, um, a lot of different kind of uh, places. And so it, it allows for some flexibility and creativity. Right. Yeah, I was going to just add, we, because we've had so many churches now, it's, it is, a, it is an, it amazing the differences of your church's, lo like the physical location of your church, right? The, do you have multiple services? Because that changes the dynamic do you are you just like 20 people who gather and you don't eat like we have several churches in our annual conference that are participating who don't actually have appointed clergy because they're so small and in these rural communities that they just they are all lay led the whole church is lay led um, so we've we've experienced a lot of variety with that and we consider every per every church that participates is co-creating this experience with us and so y'all are going to figure out ways to adapt it and make it really perfect for for what you're doing and and we really encourage that um, within you know some certain structures that we have so so i'll throw out a quick question if, as a church if we were thinking about going into this is there any additional funds that we may want to think about just having in our budget in addition mm -hmm. to the cost of the of the class, just to make sure that the program doesn't stall out after the class. Kenneth, I love that question. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Yes, I think it's I think it's a really smart thing to do. I mean, the the beauty about this work is that it's really about relationships. So it doesn't really cost a lot of money, right? It's really about a change in behavior more than it is a change in your budget. And if there are, what you discover in your gifts garden is you discover all of these, um, these connections and, and exciting things that maybe you hadn't seen before. And sometimes those things, you know, you can invest in, in a financial way, not just a relationship way. Um, so I'll give you an example. We, in our churches here, we have um, churches who participate actually become eligible for a thousand dollar grant and that's through a relationship we have with the local foundation and the great plains annual conference 
and some of those churches then are discovering you know that, that they've they've in when they go and do the work and start to learn their communities they discover that there are people already doing great things and then they use that money to invest in the community project that those people are doing so the, that's an example of that and so it might come out of like a missions budget or um you know those kind of things that maybe you already have that exist so so you know one of the questions that um i got in the chat here was how many people should i get to do the whole nine months with me and so you're what we're talking about there is your neighboring team and the team is the people who come to the workshop and it's kind of a train the trainer moment where we're training your team to take it back into your local congregation and do that work we recommend that it's i mean this is just a baseline like if you have a staff person and four lay people and that's really about like retention more than anything um and it is it, it's better as a team project like it neighboring is not a solo uh endeavor it is a team project and so if you can do it with a team it's really good to do it that way we've also had some churches who take an existing team and just like this becomes their work so if you have like an outreach team or um uh you know a sunday school class or some group that just already kind of is built that maybe uh have an affinity for this type of work that could become the team and the, it is really good if those people are aware that this is a nine month thing that they're going to keep doing right and so at least the people on the team are committed to the full the full nine month structure the people in the church can kind of come and go between the labs because they're just small groups and some of them may come and go between those and that's that's okay but really the team holding together is helpful and one one piece to add about that this this sometime churches sometimes do this but it's something to think about is there is an intentionality in the second half of the good neighbor experiment to be like neighboring as like a church and look around yeah. your church building and so do you have like any of your church members who live in the neighborhood and so i think that's like something to look at too are there neighbors like there that can kind of lead some of that work um and that might feel a little more authentic when you get to the like church uh neighborhood piece and so that that's yeah. another recommendation we offer yeah another question that got sent to me was what kind of people my what kind of um skills and the people that i'm recruiting might be helpful and so one of them is really just location like the folks who live in the neighborhood where your church building is located that's a really good one um, the other one is that this is not a book study this is an action oriented nine months so like every week your homework is to go meet neighbors and go talk to people and have learning conversations and and just the i think really a lot of people can do that but that folks are aware this isn't like a cerebral I'm going to read something, meditate on it, and come back and have a conversation on it. This is, I'm going to go and actually engage in an experiment where I'm talking to somebody usually. And then I'm going to come back, and the small groups are made up of processing how that went. So if you don't, if for instance, in your group time, you're in the, the second lab, which is where we actually go and meet neighbors, and nobody does it, the small group feels pretty flat because there's not a lot of content if you didn't actually go and try some of the experiments that are in the in the material so any other questions i i was telling jessica in the chat but oh bonnie did you have a question I do. Um, so are these um, activities that you create or are they activities that in the workshop that you can build into some things that are already uh, present or scheduled within the church? Because sometimes building something else is a little bit more difficult. So I was just yeah. curious about that. It's a great question. Um, so this is a helpful detail when your neighboring team comes to the workshop, 
uh, not only do we offer kind of like an overview and for y'all to really get a feel for like what this is all about, we also walk through some of the activities that are, are in our, our curriculum. And so you will get um, an opportunity to practice them in the workshop so that when you go back, it feels familiar. You've done it and you, you've seen it facilitated by uh, the neighboring movement and Jessica. Mm -hmm. So there's that piece. And then another important detail is all of our curriculum that we offer, so the four labs at six weeks, six weeks each, there are participants guides and then there are leaders guides. So you, everyone on your neighboring team would have access to all of that. And so um, you could have one person designated to be the leader and they use the leader's guide and have all the activities. And it's really, there's a lot of of ways that you can do it. So there is some choice where you go, oh, I wanna do that activity or our group will not like that activity. And so there is, you can kind of pick and choose because we do give you a lot of opportunity, um, but it, it's all there. And then we have churches too, who pass the leader's guide around. And so your neighboring team actually shares the responsibility of teaching one another when you go back to your local church. So those leader's guide and participants guide are available to your church to be able to be used in what, what ways feel feel most uh, comfortable for y'all. Yeah. I'm going to add a question that wasn't asked, but I think it's important. And then it's about evangelism. There's uh, often some questions about like, what does evangelism look like in this tool? Um, this is not a church growth model, just to be clear. So if, if you're here because you're looking for a church growth thing, I, I get it. I get the desire. And this is not, we're not, your church might grow, but that's not why we're doing this work, right? And so if you, we, if you send your people out and you go have them knock on their neighbor's doors to tell them about Jesus, they're just going to make all their neighbors really mad and not really want to talk to them because people don't like that. And we know that. Um, and so it's really about like relationship building. And, and what's, what's cool about that is that, I mean, general statistics will show us that about 50% of people don't go to church, have no relationship to a church, and they are not really interested in church, right? And so my next door neighbor doesn't have any interest in church. Um, he would feel pretty uh, uncomfortable even if he was in a church. He's made that clear to me. But I've known him now for six years that we've lived in this house. And, you know, last month, he came over, I was sitting on my front porch playing my banjo, and he came over and started talking to me, and he was he was saying that his daughter, who we'd met because we have a relationship with him, had just had twin baby girls, and they were preemies, and so they were not doing so well, and um, one of them in particular was going to have to have a heart surgery, which I don't know how you do that on a two-pound human baby, like that, it's, it's mind-blowing, and he was shook you know he was upset and what happened in that moment is it wasn't a moment for evangelism but there was spiritual curiosity that was happening with my neighbor on my front porch right and because i know him and he trusts me i just said hey david i don't know if you're comfortable with this but i would really just love to be able to pray for your daughter and your new grandbabies and he just i would love that please will you do that with me and I got to pray with my neighbor and we had church on my front porch, just he and I, because of our relationship and the trust that we had built. And so it's a long game and I don't know necessarily how it impacts your Ezra reports, um, but I can tell you it, it awakens something in my soul when I'm able to be like, Christ lives on my block and I can experience that on my front porch. And when a whole church full of people get excited about that and start to recognize that their faith can live outside of their building, I don't know if I would call it church growth, but I can tell you there is definitely vitality. There is definitely excitement. There is people who are on fire and excited about what they're doing. And that's what we're hoping is created in our Good Neighbor Experiment churches. I just wanted to quickly add, so for those who didn't see in the chat, the workshops will be local um, in the Dallas area and Jessica will be kind of leading that coordination, but they are in person and local and 
we'll figure out the COVID pieces when that comes. So um, there is some flexibility there, but I just wanted to briefly share. So I actually inherited a church that had gone through the good neighbor experiment. I was appointed to serve a church for two years that had, it was, I think one in the first cohort of good neighbor experiment churches. Cause some pe times people ask like, well, what's the like, what happens after the nine months? And so I got a church that had done the nine months and they really like, were on fire for neighboring. That was like my requirement when I arrived was like to read a book on neighboring because that was like what they were passionate about. <laughs> and so what happened in that local church is they actually decided to continue their work by having a neighboring team as one of their committees. So they were a bit more, they did a more formal structure that doesn't happen with every church, but because it mattered so much missionally and programmatically for them just to like have space to like, they had a budget line item for that work. Um, and they met monthly and planned uh, events that like we did a block party. They on Christmas time would drop ornaments off at the neighbor's doors. They would um, do fun like art projects in the neighborhood that were collaborative and like pass the scarf around the trees for like tree, I don't know. I, it was a very interesting idea, but they just had so much fun getting to grow in relationship beyond the good neighbor experiment. And um, so they really were, were captivated by particularly that lab two, which is to get to know the eight front doors nearest to you. And our neighboring team chair of that committee lived in the neighborhood. And she actually was not a part of our church family at all. But when through the neighboring experience, she got to meet the church that lived two doors down from her. And then she became the chair of neighboring team and part of our church family. So as Adam mentioned, it's not a church growth model, but typically people gravitate towards their, where there is energy and relationship. And so that's, that's what my church that I led, um, they, they loved it and they called themselves a neighboring church and the pastor they needed needed to be in the neighborhood and like want to connect with the neighborhood. And so that, that is one, one piece of it. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't, there's a question in the chat that Jessica might want to want to take. Yes, I can speak this because I know sometimes, especially if you're watching the recording, the, the chat's not an option for you. So um, Bonnie asked if there are churches in the area who are already committed to attending. Um, so I've gone through training for as being a facilitator, but First United Methodist Church Allen has not gone through this. And so I am wearing kind of two hats, right? The facilitator hat, but also the church staff member hat and I'm recruiting my team and casting this vision with my senior pastor because I'm an associate and uh, uh, this Saturday is our ad council retreat so I'm going to talk with them about this but first Alan will be participating in this cohort and um, Paige is it safe to speak for Christ Plano? <laughs> Christ Plano also plans to participate and I'm grateful for that. Um, I've gotten some uh, confirmation from some other pastors of local churches but they are also in that process of getting their laity on board and making sure this is something that the church has passion and commitment around. Because I know all of us have probably um, seen initiatives where one person was really excited and no one else, it was not, this, the spirit was not moving in the whole congregation in that moment. So they are working, doing that work um, to make sure that this is something that is the right season for them. But I'm excited because I, I feel like off the top of my head, there are probably six churches I could already name that are pretty close to confirming that this is something they want to be a part of this spring. And that's very exciting. Yeah. So and, you know, we, have, we can also talk about geography as far as workshops in if they're if all the churches are clustered up north and maybe we find somewhere mm -hmm. central to us. We don't necessarily have to drive to Dallas. So this is you already put a date down for the first workshop. Would you give us a date? Yeah. April 30th. Yes. April 30th. So it's the it's after Easter. Get through Lent and Easter, and then we'll do this on the other side. Uh, this is, go ahead. Well, this is Ted. I was just curious if this is the first time the neighboring experiment has been brought to North Texas Conference for the United Methodist Church. No, we did. Um, I think we've had two or three cohorts. Uh, Ryan Klink was our facilitator there before, um, and he he's moved on to Iowa actually now. So, uh, and, but we that was pre-pandemic. We had a, a couple cohorts that were in uh, Dallas area. 
So there's, so I think what I'm hearing you say is there, there aren't any churches who are already uh, engaged in this initiative. This is kind of the kickstart for our North Texas Conference. Ed, can I speak to that? Um, th this is Paige. I'm at Christ United, and we actually started this process uh, outside of g &E, outside of the Good Neighbor Experiment, because I was having the same feelings and praying for discernment as Jessica was during the pandemic. And so we started what we call Christ United Neighbors at, at our church in um, through research and uh, lots of different um, demographic studies and congregational studies and all of that through Mission Insight. We started in May to pilot this. And I, from the day that we um, put this information in the senior pastor's weekly newsletter, um, I received 10 people who were interested in doing this in their neighborhood. So we started, that became our core committee. And we started doing this to just see how it would work. And with the same premise as g and &E, we wanted to develop relationships and go to our neighbors, not as Paige, the pastor at Christ United or a member of Christ United, but as Paige who lives two doors down or two streets over. And so we've been doing this all along. We try to have a, an event every month. Like Maddie said, we've already created a committee. We already have a budget. Um, we have a line item for that budget. And my role at Christ United has shifted to be specifically the, uh, the pastor of off-campus ministries so that we can fully mm -hmm. focus on this as well as online. Um, what I love about g and &E when I got when I started talking with Jessica is one of the biggest challenges that our committee, the people who were piloting this had, was how do I go out? Like, what are some ways I can go out and meet my neighbors? I, I'm an introvert and I don't, I'm not sure, or, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. What do we do about COVID? Like lots of questions around that. And so what I'm doing with our group is having us take a step back and participate in the G&E curriculum, because I think it will help us to brainstorm and try some things that maybe we haven't tried. Like we know some of the things that are working, but I think there are other things that will be valuable to us through this curriculum. So we're going to do that. Now, the other thing that we have already done at Christ United is through the month of January, we've been promoting Christ United Neighbors to the congregation as a whole. So this is our hard launch. We've piloted. Now we're doing a hard launch. And I have... 16 people who have come to me in the last three weeks who want to do this in their neighborhood, in addition to the 10 I've already got. And so a great problem to have, I'm going to be digging into Mission Insight day and night for a while to try and get all their data to them. But I say all that because I think that we are an example of how this can work and be successful in your own church. And while I, you know, there are churches like First Allen, and I know Sharon's at Custer Road, I think the overlap of our uh, congregants within our same neighborhoods is a beautiful thing because we are a connectional denomination, and I think we can work together to reach even more people than we would have been able to reach if it were just one church in one area. So, I, I had a Maybe I just respond real quickly to Ted's question, then I'll get out of the way, Cindy. I definitely want to right. hear your question comment. I yeah. just, uh, Ted, if part of your question was like, who else in the North Texas Conference has experimented with this? Who else might we be in dialogue with about what their experience was like? Um, Adam mentioned there were a couple of cohorts pre-pandemic, and uh, those were uh, ecumenical uh, in nature. But a couple of churches that I remember uh, having significant experience um, in those early cohorts were First United Methodist Church in Dallas and uh, Reverend Holly Bandell, who was on staff then and is still today, um, is close to that work. And then the other is uh, First United Methodist in Plano, on the east side of Plano, and uh, retired pastor uh, Diane Presley, again, was sort of close to that work. 
So those are a couple of other um, you know, potential dialogue partners for anybody curious to you know, learn how it landed in those churches. Paige, what church do you attend or staff on staff for? I'm at Christ United Methodist in uh, Plano. Okay, Cindy, let's hear your question. So, so my, my question is maybe on the opposite end. So you say, you know, maybe the spirit isn't moving right now and that you're starting a cohort in April and that's, you know, three months. That's not, in some ways, that's not a long time to, mm -hmm. so, I mean, I might put something out there and solicit 30 people, but I doubt it. Um, so if the spirit's not moving in us yet, but maybe moves in us three months from that, is there a possibility of, of starting another cohort or do we're going to have to wait another nine months before you finish this one? Or do you have you thought about that? I think there's a couple. So Jessica will answer to what Jessica's uh, <laughs> comfortable with. I won't speak yeah. for her. So How many cohorts was... are we going to volunteer Jessica for? Right, That's yeah. <laughs> But I will say the neighboring movement actually hosts online uh, every January and August, we will launch an online cohort. And so we, we really recommend the in-person because it just is so much better in person. But if, as you said, your church isn't quite ready in April and you're not sure when would be next, there would be one starting in August um, okay. if you have a church. And then you would connect with churches across the country in a virtual Zoom workshop. Okay. Thank right. You. Well, and for speaking to my own bandwidth, I think I, I always love to think about all the case scenarios, worst and best. And um, Paige and I are actually collaborators in um, a, a kind of an overarching uh, initiative called North Texas Neighbors. And um, one of my things was what happens if we get 20 churches who want to do this, right? Because kind of the cap that is ideal for this is 12 um, so that everyone has these, these conversations and has bandwidth and has some space in the room. And I thought, wouldn't it be, I mean, who knows? We could be running um, in the same, at the same time period. We could do one, start one three months later, six months later. I have been an associate pastor most of my career so far, uh, which is almost 15 years. And I kind of love it because it gives me bandwidth and opportunities to do things like this, which will serve not only my church, but the larger church across the connection. And so um, that's exciting for me and my senior pastor is supportive, which is always helpful. Um, so speaking of this over this larger initiative that uh, we're working on called North Texas Neighbors. I wanted to give Paige just like a couple minutes to talk about another webinar that's gonna come up because I know sometimes in my church, at least when I started talking about Jenny and it's not evangelism, it's relationship first, but I don't know anyone really who has come to Jesus except by relationship, whether it was their mom and dad bringing them as children or whether it was a friend, a trusted person inviting them to church. I only know people who've come to Christ through relationship. Um, the signs on the street corners don't seem to work as an evangelism tool. Um, they actually seem to bring up a lot of defensiveness and, and other unpleasant feelings in folks who encounter bullhorns or signs or um, the, you know, the people at the 4th of July events who would come around and say, do you know where you're going when you die? That's, those don't seem, they, I, don't, I, I don't know why we keep doing them sometimes, but we being Christians. Um, there's Paige. Okay, so Paige has another webinar coming up because there is going to be another aspect for churches um, as we come out of the g &E that might that'll focus more on discipleship because I know my church had questions around that. Okay, after g &E, after we're good neighbors, after our church is a good neighbor, um, is there, where's the this other component for it? And so Paige and Christ United have already um, been developing some of that work and there'll be more. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, while Jessica's primary contact at the conference has been uh, the Center for Missional Outreach, my primary um, involvement in the conference is the Center for Church Development. And so part of this Neighbors initiative that we started, um, we hope that God will work in and through the leaders of those neighborhoods to then form interest groups or discipleship uh, some sort of discipleship group, whether that be an interest group or a fresh expression, or maybe it's Bible study or book club or worship watch party, it could go anywhere, but we are leaving room for the Holy Spirit to move 
and work um, in each neighborhood. So each neighborhood could look different. What is uh, an option through the Center of Church Development is if we have, if we do this, it's considered part of the new faces, new spaces effort. And if we have a discipleship component, we can apply for a micro grant through the uh, through that group, through that department at the conference. And so um, there are some great things that are coming out of that piece. We are still in the beginning stages of gathering and developing relationships, which does take time. And so there's not a push for discipleship, but we are anticipating that that will happen in the long term. And so we're preparing for that. The webinar on February 10th at 10 a.m., uh, you'll see information about that coming soon, but <clears throat> we will talk more specifically about next steps into the g &E piece, but also into um, what happens afterward. There are some things that we want to do, Jessica and I have talked about doing within phase one, the equipping phase, we're calling it. Um, where you're going through GE, but you're also getting your mission insight data prepared so that when you do launch with certain um, leads within neighborhoods, they have the information that they need to get started. Um, so there's some overlap to phase one, the equipping stage, and phase two, the disciple stage. Um, but we're going to clarify a lot of that in this second webinar. Awesome. Thank you. And Maddie just put the registration over in the chat um, for those of y'all who are ready, you know that this is something you want to pursue. Um, there's a specific link for North Texas to participate. Um, and then also I put my email address over in the chat, Jessica W at fmcallen.org. I know some of y'all are having to go, but um, I was sharing with someone who uh, DM'd me over there. I know sometimes that your church needs more information. And so if you have a leadership meeting or you have people that you think are the right folks and you want to get them in a room or even in a Zoom chat and have me talk with them, I'm more than happy to um, make myself available for those things because I know we can only gain so much information and remember so much after one hour. Thank you all so much for being on the call. It was good yeah. to meet you. Good to meet everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, and I think Andrew and Andy might have something. Oh, just real quick. Um, so we have, if we don't want finances to be a, uh, the reason that a, a church cannot participate. So, um, you know, there are ministry with grant opportunities that are coming up and I will uh, put that link in the chat as well and, uh, and send that out with the uh, link to this video recording out to all participants and those that registered. So please send this on uh, as a, the recording of this to folks that you think might be interested, others in your local churches, just to kind of get them up to speed. And uh, we appreciate your being here. Andy, is there anything else that we need to mention? I think we've covered it. Just uh, thanks so much to Adam and Maddie for joining us, uh, Jessica and page two for um, championing this effort and just look for the ways the spirit will move as we have said so many times on this call amen thank y'all